Hi everyone, I'm uh, this week's uh, plant breeding seminar speaker. My name is Volker Nischler and I'm a professor in the computer science and engineering department at the University of Minnesota. My primary research area is robotics. Now you might wonder what a roboticist have to do with plant breeding. Um, and what I would like to do in my talk is actually give you a sense of uh, why plant breeding and agriculture in general is a very interesting uh, research domain for robotics. For this purpose, we divided the seminar into a collection of uh, shorter talks. I will kick off the series with this one and I will give you an uh, overview of ongoing research in my lab with an emphasis on agricultural and environmental monitoring applications. And then there will be a you know, series of follow-up shorter talks where my students will present further te technical details for those of you who might be interested in them. To understand why agriculture is an amazing application domain for robotics, let's go back to the very basics. When robotics researchers design robotic systems, they often think about sense, plan, and act components which operate in a cycle. To see what this means, let's start with an example. So in our representative scenario, there is a carrot and a rabbit, and the goal of the rabbit is to eat the carrot. Now let's try to model this scenario through the eyes of a roboticist. So in our model, there is an object, the carrot, and some sort of a signal um, arrives from this object. So it could be the sunlight bouncing off of the object, and then this, this signal enters through the receptors of the um, of the rabbit. So here the boundary is what we call the rabbit and then you know the sun rays enter the, the rabbit's eyes and through the receptors it, they generate some sort of an electrical signal that goes to the brain. Now at some point the signal becomes a symbol the carrot or whatever the rabbits call the carrot and these symbols are aggregated into a model which may include a two-dimensional world together with the sort of location of the of the carrot. Now once we have this model, then this is usually passed on to a planning module, which figures out, you know, a plan to get to the carrot, which could be a path. And then this plan is used to generate a series of control commands, which could be, for example, a series of actions that follow the the, the trajectory that corresponds to the path that the plan came up with. And then the rabbit executes these actions and arrives at the object. These uh, steps constitute the sense, plan, and act cycle where, you know, the perception algorithm receives a signal, turns it into a symbol, and maybe builds a model. And then the planning, you know, component takes this model and comes up with a plan. And then the action module takes this plan and generates a series of actions. In fact, we can further simplify these steps into just two boxes, the perception box, which constitutes the top level, and then the action box, which constitutes the bottom level of the diagram that we just came up with. Now, critical to this perception action cycle is the model, which is generated by the perception module and you know, used for, by the action, action module to come up with plans and then eventually actions. Typically, these models uh, at the moment are hand-designed by robotics researchers um, and perception algorithms that generate those specific models are hand-designed separately and then, you know, planning algorithms which use these models are designed separately. Now, obviously, this is a simple model and it's by no means designed to actually model the cognitive processes um, associated with, with rabbits. Um, but as simple as it is, it is the foundation of many automation algorithms which have been very successful. So what we see in this example is a food processing plant where, you know, the objects, the items to be packaged are, you know, detected. There may be poses computed and then the arm actually puts them in, in the right bins. By the way, these are just videos I found on, on YouTube. Uh, they're very interesting, so I put the links here. And if you're interested in the sort of state of the art in you know, food packaging or what I will show next, uh, please visit these links. 
Now, similarly, in the agriculture domain, this uh, perception action cycle has also been very, very successful. So here we get a glimpse of the model that's used for these uh, autonomous combines. It is probably a two-dimensional world and the, the tractor is represented as a point with the orientation and the, the sensing here is primarily probably GPS together with some onboard sensors. But as you see, this sort of explicit 2D model is enough to, um, to generate autonomous tractors. And you see in this video, to emphasize the autonomy, they show that it is uh, hands-free. And here's the link for, for that video that I also just showed. Now, as I try to make the case with the food packaging plant and the autonomous tractors, this approach of having a perception component separate from an action component with a hand design, in, in a hand design model in between has been very successful for autonomous applications. But you might also be surprised to hear that this approach is nowhere you know, close to modeling what actual rabbits are capable of. So as you can see in these videos, um, to survive, rabbits actually have to operate in a very complex world. They have to you know, represent much more complicated, complicated settings. Think about predators. They need to search for food even if they don't see it and be capable of performing very complex actions. Now, if you want to design robots that can operate in environments that are much more complex than factories or you know, open fields, for example, if you want to design robots that can pick raspberries in a small farm or operate in you know, our messy homes, that's not my kitchen, by the way, um, then we need to push the limits of what such models can do at the interface of perception and action components. So a lot of my research is uh, at the perception and action uh, interface. And what we try to do is, is essentially two things. We, we try to design algorithms which often use geometric models that are aware of you know, the limitations of the perception capabilities of the, of the robot system but they can perform actions with provable performance guarantees. The other thing we can we try to do is we try to validate these systems in realistic applications, and this is where agriculture and environmental monitoring comes into the picture. For the rest of my talk, I will give an overview of our research. Um, I'll, I'll start with environmental monitoring applications that you know we, we uh, worked on, and specifically uh, give examples of search and coverage problems that we studied. And then I will move over to agriculture, where we try to push the boundaries of perception and action capabilities of robots in these in these settings. Um, and as I give examples, I will try to focus on sort of representative systems and give you examples of optimization problems that we study. So one of the biggest projects in uh, our lab that we completed about 10 years ago was focused on tracking carp, which is considered an uh, invasive species. So around the time I moved to Minnesota, I ran into this article, which mentioned that you know in Chicago, in the canal, they found a few carp, and to prevent them from entering the Great Lakes, they actually locked it down and poisoned the six mile stretch. So the fear there is if the fish enter the Great Lakes, then they can actually destroy the fishing industry by taking over the habitat for, of, of other uh, fish. Of course, uh, Minnesota is the land of 10,000 lakes, and it is also the birthplace of uh, Mississippi. So there's a lot of research on aquatic invasive species. And in particular, I ended up collaborating with Peter Sorensen from the Department of Fisheries, who uh, is an expert on uh, carp behavior. So the way they study carp is they use uh, radio tags, which are surgically implanted into live fish, and then they release them back in the water and they, they track them. Um, so typically, the tracking involves two researchers. One of them steers the boat, and then the other one, you can see the directional antenna here. Um, by rotating the antenna and listening to the signal strength, the researcher gets a bearing, and so which allows them to move toward the fish, who's, and then they record the location of the, of the fish. So robots are meant to do the dirty, dull, and dangerous task for us. 
and this seemed like a great opportunity to uh, design robotic systems to do the carb tracking. So we ended up building a fleet of autonomous boats, uh, which to you see two of them uh, in this in this figure. Uh, they're about six feet long, and we de developed a series of uh, algorithms and deployed the system for, for tracking CARP. So this is the work of Pratap Tokekar, who is now an assistant professor at University of Maryland, and Josh Vanderhoek, who is now a group supervisor at NASA, working on similar systems in much larger uh, scales. Other main researchers who worked on this uh, in this project include Nargis Nuri, who is now at Google, and she worked primarily on search algorithms, and Patrick Plonsky, who recently uh, finished his PhD and took over as the CEO of our uh, yield monitoring startup, which I will talk about in, in a little bit. So on the algorithmic front, we focused on two tasks. Um, search is the task of uh, establishing contact with the signal. So initially, when we put the water, uh, boats on the water, we don't hear the signal, so we need to go and find um, establish at least some sort of contact with the signal. And now once we start hearing the signal, we can actually start taking bearing measurements and localize them. So taking a bearing measurement in this scenario entails uh, rotating the antenna. And uh, it is a costly, in terms of time, operation because to make the, the tags last long, they're designed to beep about once a second. So if we sample, let's say, you know, 18 or 36 degrees, and then if we take five measurements at each degree, then one bearing measurement can cost us, you know, up to up to five minutes. So localization is a task where, you know, the number of measurements need to be optimized. Uh, but before I give you some details about these formulations, let's see the system in action. So this is one of the first uh, full deployments of the, the system, where we input a you know, set of regions that needs to be covered by the boat. And then the boat goes out there, uh, plans this trajectory, and then looks for the signal in each of these, each of these regions. So, uh, and I remind you, this is, you know, in year 2010, 2011. So this was one of the first systems fully autonomous that could operate. Uh, of course, uh, this is Minnesota and our lakes freeze. Um, but we had a similar system, this time on an autonomous uh, ground vehicle, which can do the same task uh, on, on frozen lakes where the car part still alive, but maybe less active uh, under, the, under the ice. And these videos, the, they don't really do a, a justice for you know, how hard these experiments are. Um, here you see Josh calibrating the odometry on this ground robot to make it work on, on, on ice. And I like showing these videos to make the case that, you know, it is not easy to do these uh, robot experiments in these types of harsh conditions. So as I mentioned previously, once we establish, the, establish contact with the signal, um, we can actually rotate the antenna, listen to the signal, and turn this into bearing measurements. And you see in this video the boat uh, doing just that. So it's sampling angles and at each angle taking a collection of measurements and from these it is uh, estimating the bearing. And here two boats, they collaborate, they collect bearing measurements simultaneously to accurately localize the, the targets. And with this system we could localize the targets down to, down to a meter using just uh, vanilla off-the-shelf GPS on, on the boats. So toward the end of that project, uh, we started thinking about using aerial vehicles instead of boats, which are smaller and they can be used uh, over the, the lakes, but uh, also on, on the land to track other animals such as moose or, or the bear. Um, and the idea is the same. So the antenna you see on these vehicles, they're still directional, so we can detect the signal and then rotate the, the UAB and uh, get a bearing measurement. So here you see the system system in action. Um, we have three UAVs and it takes about, you know, three, four people at least to deploy them in, in the field and design an experiment while ensuring that, you know, everything is safe and so on. But what we did is these vehicles, they can actually fly in formation. So they can, you know, in this case, they follow leader follower formation, forming a triangle. 
and then they can cover the area and localize uh, t targets as, as they fly. So those are some of the systems, uh, systems that we develop. And just as an example of an optimization problem that we study that the uh, perception action interface, let's look at this active sensing problem for bearing based target localization. So for this, we will go back to our rabbit friend. And if you remember, its, uh, it's goal was to eat this rabbit. So when you see an object um, from a camera or an eye, uh, technically, all you can measure is the direction of the object. So unless you have additional information about the size of the object, um, you cannot tell um, tell where the object is along this ray. And if you have some uncertainty in your measurements, then this ray actually could be thought of as a cone, but all we can say is that the object lies somewhere inside this infinite cone. Now, this is one of the reasons why we have two eyes, or you can move around uh, if you uh, if you want to localize an object that's far and take another measurement and by intersecting these measurements you can uh, start localizing this target and in this uh, simple geometric scenario we can view the area of the intersection as a measure of uncertainty uh, of the localization now there are various ways to formalize this uh, process of formulating the local the uncertainty in localization and one of them is um, we just look at the bearing measurement. So if this is the target and this is our object, we just look at this angle, which can be obtained by taking the arc tan of um, of these two, uh, two, two distances. And then we can say that we have some process that adds noise to these measurements. Now, when we, um, when we have multiple measurements, then we can ask the question, if I perturb these measurements, what happens to my estimate? So this perturbation can be formalized as a you know a generalized derivative in the form of a Jacobian, and then we can take the look at the determinant of this Jacobian to get a sense of the area of the uncertainty. And the Fisher information matrix is related to this determinant and it gives you a sense of the information available in the measurements that we take. So then the question we face is, as we receive these measurements about locations of objects, how should we adjust our own uh, position so that uh, our estimation gets better and better and better? So in the past, we studied this problem in a purely geometric setting, and we were able to get you know online algorithms with provable uh, competitive ratios, but only for simple scenarios where there's one target and one or two um, objects that are trying to localize the target. Recently, using some of the newer reinforcement learning uh, strategies, we were able to address the same problem in a more general setting. So what you see here in this next video is the red dot is the robot trajectory, the blue dots are the targets, and then the, um, the colors indicate the uncertainty. So as the measurements arrive, the robot decides to adjust its trajectory and minimizes um, the uncertainty around the target locations. So I just show you uh, examples of robotic systems that we develop for environmental monitoring, as well as the algorithms that we developed at the perception and action interface. Now, as we gain more experience in developing these systems, we wanted to push the the limits of what the robots can do in more complex environments. And this is where we started looking into some of the applications in agriculture. So over the years, we worked on uh, a number of different agricultural applications, but the biggest project by far in my lab was on, on monitoring apple orchards. So we developed both aerial ground systems, which could also be used manually, that can autonomously collect data, and process this data to do yield mapping. So throughout the years, we developed many systems um, and made sure that they can work under harsh conditions. So this is one of the earlier UAV systems that we developed, and our protocol in operating under these windy conditions was to make sure that the UAV is tethered so that we don't do uh, we don't run into the trees by accident. We 
we couple these systems with perception algorithms, which allow you to collect data in a very unconstrained fashion. And in this example, I believe it's nectarines, we're able to not only detect, but also track the nectarines as the camera moves around the tree. We also developed algorithms to do uh, 3D models of the orchard, as well as semantic maps. And here, semantic means that the algorithm can also differentiate between different trees, which has direct applications, for example, um, for phenotyping. Um, you see here that our algorithms, we don't just detect the apples, but we can actually accurately localize them in the 3D space, um, including data that comes from both sides of the, of the tree so that we can obtain accurate uh, counts as well as size. Um, in, in collaboration with uh, Jim Luby and Cindy Tong from the um, Department of Horticultural Sciences, we were able to compare our results against the true, true yield results and obtain one of the most comprehensive results on yield mapping uh, compared against you know, the, the post-harvest yield, yield counts. These, these efforts uh, culminated in a University of Minnesota spin-off uh, startup called Farm Vision Technologies, where you know, farmers can use our systems and algorithms to accurately map their yield uh, before harvest. This video shows uh, the system's capabilities. So the farmers can just basically mount a camera on their tractor and now we get the footage. And from here, we can actually tell them how many apples they have, where they are, what their sizes is, and then generate yield uh, maps uh, like this um, to give you know information that will be useful for them, for their harvest planning, for their sales, um, and planning for, for future years. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, Patrick Plonsky, my former PhD student, is the CEO of uh, Farm Vision Technologies. Um, let me give you some examples of the technical problems that we need to solve to uh, obtain these results. So one of the interesting problems that we had to uh, advance the state of the art in computer vision was on merging the reconstructions that come from the two sides of a row. So if the camera moves along the, the row, um, Building a reconstruction of the visible side can be done using um, using existing techniques. And this is what you see here. And now you can move on the other side and you get another reconstruction. Now what's difficult is to actually merge these reconstructions because there's very little overlap between the um, between the two two reconstructions. So then the problem we want to solve is how to merge these two, two reconstructions. And there are two uh, methods that can be used for this, um, for merging reconstructions in general. One of them uses uh, common features to align the two reconstructions, which is not applicable in this case, uh, at least for point features, because there's almost no uh, common, um, common points uh, between the two reconstructions. Um, for the second approach, we could actually use uh, maybe odometry information or the fact that we, the, the camera motion is continuous and we can track the motion of the camera as the system completes a full loop uh, around, the, around the row. And of course, this is only applicable for this particular data collection regime where you actually end up looping around the, the row, which by itself may not be ideal. But the problem with these approaches is because most of the features come from the trees, then they tend to be biased uh, toward the features uh, about the tree and they don't successfully align the, to the trees, for example, the trunks themselves, and then they lead to errors in, in the tree, the apple alignment and errors in, in, in counting. This slide makes that case. If you just go along a loop and then try to close the loop with these, these measurements, then there's misalignment at, at the end. So along with my uh, students, uh, Van Bo Dong and Provokar Roy, we developed a method which uses global information to overcome these challenges. And in particular, we use two pieces of information. First, we use the, the silhouettes of the entire reconstructions to roughly align the, uh, align the two sides. And then we use semantic information. Specifically, we detect the tree trunks and we align them into a cylinder 
um, to merge the the reconstructions uh, d d accurately. Now, for uh, detection and, and tracking, we started out uh, with more traditional computer vision algorithms, but along the the way. Uh, deep learning based algorithms started being the state of the art for pretty much every computer vision ta uh, task. So then we also switched over to you know deep learning based methods. Um, and one of the uh, main outcomes of our project was actually a an a Apple detection and segmentation data set uh, where we released the data that we collected over multiple years on different different types of apples. So this data set, which is primarily the work of my uh, PhD student, Nikolai Hani, Provokar Roy, as well as many undergraduate students who uh, worked on manually segmenting the images, is uh, one of the ways we gave back to the community. Uh, and we released the data set. And since it's uh, released in September 2019, it's been downloaded uh, 6,870 times as of a few days ago. Um, next, I would like to give some examples of how um, our application-driven research led to interesting fundamental problems. Um, and one of the problems that I want to talk about is this label generation. So the um, I talked about the data set, and you you can appreciate that this is a very labor-intensive uh, intensive task. So, for example, for gen to gen generate labels like this one. Um, it might take about 30 minutes per, per image. Um, you might have heard of the term uh, deep fake for uh, machine learning based algorithms, which can generate fake images of, uh, of celebrities using you know, machine learning methods and in particular generative adversarial networks. So now we started playing with this idea, um, can we generate you know, images of let's say green apples using our you know data that we collected in an orchard with with red uh, apples so as we were um, working on this problem where we had some initial success um, we we started working on a more general null view synthesis the specific problem we study is the following we're given a single view of an object and our goal is to generate images of the same object but from different views we presented a new representation and a learning method which allows us to generate novel views from arbitrary angles. Our method uses only two views of the object during training time. What's important to notice is that, as seen in this example, these two views do not necessarily cover the entire object. Our method learns how to render views from the back of the car, even though the back is not seen from any of the input views. We see that our method generates images with quality comparable or better than the state of the art, but using significantly some smaller number of views during training time. For example, state of the art methods use 50 or more M images, but our method uses only two images. Here are some additional examples. And here we see out of domain generalization where our method is able to generate views of cars that have not been seen before during training time. And finally, here we see an application to generating novel views of faces. In my opinion, this work is a good example of how applied research can pave the way to fundamental results and generally applicable algorithms and representations. So, so far I talked about applications where we use uh, robots to collect the uh, data and i gave examples of active you know sensor planning algorithms as well as representations we developed so recently we have been interested in going beyond data collection and using robots to actively manipulate the farms we have an ongoing collaboration with professor paul johan Fromm's group from norwegian university of life sciences on developing robotic uh, strawberry pickers for these tabletop settings and here you see one of the first successful field trials of the system um, from a farm in, in Norway. So as a treat this is the very first strawberry picked by the system successfully.
yeah. or sort of successfully where I sh where we learned that we should have properly secured the pot before we did the experiment. Now fruit picking is a great uh, application domain because even in these relatively controlled tabletop settings, detecting fruits in these clusters, designing grippers which are capable of untangling them and picking the um, the the fruit and coordinating across you know various components of such complex systems are still uh, remaining challenges and we are actively collaborating with uh, Paul Johan's group as well as their spin-off startup to develop algorithms to address these challenges. The next application uh, we've been we are currently working on is mowing cow pastures. So we have an LCCMR project and an ongoing collaboration with uh, West Central uh, Outreach Center uh, in Morris and Toro on developing an autonomous mower. So let me show you some footage from a recent uh, PBS segment on, on our work. So these are the pastures and here the cows uh, eat the good grass and then somebody has to go and take out the weeds and our system, which is called Cowbot, is doing just that. So you see it autonomously going over the field. And uh, right now it's just following a predetermined path. And we're working on adding additional autonomy so that it can target the weeds and avoid uh, um, uh, avoid obstacles. Uh, this is in collaboration with Toro. Uh, Jack Gust is the lead engineer from the Toro side. And uh, this is an aerial, nice aerial footage of the system. And the leads from my group are, this is Minghan and together with Parishit Maini, they're developing, they're still working on this system. Next, uh, let me tell you a little bit about our sort of ongoing work and interesting future research directions. Um, we have an active collaboration and ongoing project with uh, C. Yang from Bioproducts and Biosystems uh, Engineering Department, as well as the Serial, uh, Serial Diseases Research Lab uh, led by Shahri Arkianian here on using um, either drones or ground vehicles to detect the uh, wheat rust. This is a challenging problem because typically the wheat are uh, packed pretty densely and it is very difficult to see wheat rust both from above or you know from from the ground so as part of this research we're thinking about designing novel um, systems that could be perhaps used for this purpose as well so i just mentioned our uh, lccmr project on mowing cow pastures and in the second phase of this project we would also like to uh, weed uh, corn rows and especially in mid-season where the plant is a few feet high so we are de developing robots that can go through the corn rows as well as novel uh, mechanisms to uh, kill the weed. And here, uh, this is fresh uh, from the lab that my student Jie Cheng is developing a system which can actually point the laser at a target. So the laser is moving and now you'll see once it's uh, uh, detected, it fixates on the it fixates on the object. Um, so this summer we're hoping to test out the system to figure out the power levels and you know uh, see if we can use it for killing the I will stop here. As I mentioned in the beginning, we're planning to post additional videos presenting further technical details. I just want to thank all of my past and present group members. Their hard work and dedication made all of this work possible. I also would like to thank our sponsors for funding our research. And finally, I'd like to thank you all. I hope this wasn't too boring. Uh, my email is there. It's just my last name at uman.edu. And that's our lab website. Uh, and if you have any questions and if you would like to discuss anything, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you.